Yeah. So we'll do this. Yeah. This. Yeah. Let's see if that works. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Oh, now you can. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for your patience. We're going to get started. Hi, um, welcome. My name is Mackenzie Stevens. I'm the director of the Visual Arts Center, where Carolina Quesado and David de Rosas' work is on view through December 3rd. The Blessings of the Mystery centers West Texas, focusing on the entanglements of histories, cultures, institutions, economies, and the environment in the region. The centerpiece of the exhibition is The Teaching of the Hands, a film that combines archival footage with reenactments and documentation of the West Texas landscape. Alongside the film, the exhibition contains two site-specific installations, works on paper, and objects culled from special collections at UT, including the Billy Turner Plant Center, Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory, the Biodiversity Collection, and the Bureau for Economic Ge Geology. Before I introduce our speakers, 
I would like to thank our partners and sponsors of this program, Leela Spenson, Latin American Studies and Collection, and Tiffany Giruti, who did a tremendous amount of work to bring this to fruition, and to our sponsor, Humanities Texas. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to the people who have been instrumental in the behind the scenes logistics for this, including Claire Donnelly, Lauren McKnight, Richard Stimpert, and Devin Gerstenhaber. Thank you all. We will conclude the conversation with a brief Q&A. So please save your questions for the end. Clipping this on, let's see if it works. Ooh. <laughs> and please join us in the VAC's courtyard for a reception after the program ends where the conversation can continue. Carolina Quesada lives and works in Los Angeles. Her multidisciplinary practice examines themes of environmental activism, encounters between history and memory, indigenous rights and the formation and dissemination of knowledge. Her work has been exhibited widely at institutions such as the MCA Chicago, ICA Boston, El Museo del Barrio, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, Maspi in Sao Paulo, and the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, amongst others. Debbie DeRosas is an experimental filmmaker who lives and works in Los Angeles. His films have been screened in festivals and film curated series worldwide. Last year, DeRosas was an artist in residence at Headland Center for the Arts in San Francisco. He's a lecturer at the School of Cinema at San Francisco State University and a visiting professor <laughs> sorry, at Cal State Northridge in Greater Los Angeles. Juan Mancius is the tribal chair of the Carrizo Camacrudo. Mancius is a writer and an environmental activist whose work towards environmental justice in Texas and in the greater US is expansive. Mancius's books include So Your Grandma is Indian and You Don't Like Controversy and Sounds of Oppression. Mancius earned his BA in political science at Texas Tech, completed master's work in history at Texas Tech, has a certification in pastoral studies from Incarnate Word and an honorary doctorate in universal theology. Marta Menchaca is professor of anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research interests are in the field of historical and legal anthropology. She has published five books and is the author of 19 articles and book chapters examining schooling, immigration, civil rights, and race relations. Dr. Menchaca's upcoming book, the Mexican American Experience will be published spring 2021 and examines the civil rights history of Mexican Americans in Texas. Her previous books include Mexican Immigrants, A Texas History, The Mexican Outsiders, A Community History of Marginalization and Discrimination in California, The Politics of Dependency, U.S. Reliance on Mexican Oil and Farm Labor, and Recovering History, Constructing Oops, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Recovering History, Constructing Race, the Indian Black and White Roots of Mexican Americans. From Mexican Outsiders, Professor Menchaca also received the Gustavus Myers Center Award for the Study of Human Rights in North America. She is also the co-author of Barrio Ballots, which deals with electoral politics. Fred Valdez Jr. is Professor of Anthropology at UT Austin and Director of the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory. Valdez began teaching at UT in 1988, and his research interests include the study of material culture, such as ceramic and lithic technologies, settlement, settlement patterns and small site studies, and the emergence of social and political complexity in Central America, Latin America, and the American Southwest. Please join me in welcoming Carolina, David, Dr. Mancias, Dr. Menchaca, and Dr. Valdez. Thank you, Mackenzie, and thank everyone um, for, for sharing the space with us. And thank you for, for the panelists too. Uh, so uh, we're very excited that, that this is the first iteration of the Blessings of the Mystery. It's a body of work uh, that we have developed over the last three years with David. Uh, after the Visual Arts Center iteration, it will travel to Rubin Center in UTEP, uh, University of Texas in El Paso, and to Ballroom Marfa. Um, 
that will be next year. And I think it will have a stop in New York too at, uh, at MoMA. So, so uh, there, there will be different iterations, uh, kind of a, some of the site-specific installations such as having and quartering, which is the one made with the flags will respond to, to maps uh, from El Paso, for example, uh, or, or to Marfa's initial survey map when it visits there. And, uh, and we wanted to open this discussion and we're super excited to have um, Marta, Fred and, and Juan here to, to speak about different topics uh, that, that for us, uh, that we try to convey through the works. Uh, of course, in a more symbolic and poetic way, and hopefully um, you will help us unpack some of these issues in the round table today. Thank you. Uh, so one of the, the, uh, the well, we, vis we visited Texas for the first time in 2018. Uh, and the first thing that uh, uh, surprised us is that uh, we were almost all the time uh, being surrounded by fences. And then, like we learned, how basically the entire state, state uh, actually the ninety-five percent is on private uh, hands, and that will be uh, Marta, if you don't mind, uh, the first uh, question: uh, What uh, the, the, that history that end up uh, having this um, uh, environment in Texas, and also like how this fences, uh, land privatization also relate to borderline uh, policies and, and the history is uh, related uh, to them. And when I am asking you the question, I mean, this is an open question, so either like Juan or Fred, you can also like bring your ideas uh, when you want. Thank you. It will be the fencing associated with the entry of the uh, Anglo-American settlers uh, coming in and privatizing uh, their their plots of that that they either had purchased through grants or through um, or or through uh, land rights. Oh. 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 Okay. In the area of South <clears throat> Texas, in the area of South Texas, uh, the the region has been basically uh, open range for the cattle and then the, the stock. The, uh, there were. Uh, Okay, cattle and uh, sheep and the other uh, stock had been uh, brought into Texas with the uh, in in the uh, colonization period of the Spanish, particularly with the uh, the entry of the missions, which started in 1690, and uh, continue on uh, in terms of the construction of, of more missions up, up until the, uh, I would say, the, by the 1770s, all mission activity basically uh, ends. So with the Anglo-American population, uh, after the uh, uh, Texas uh, War of Independence, and then later on with the Mexican-American War uh, of, uh, that ends in 1848, the uh, Anglo-Americans begin to migrate uh, in large numbers, especially into the areas of South Texas, where you had really uh, open range. But the, the uh, uh, battles or the, the fencing wars <clears throat> become very uh, conflictual and, and uh, become a, a problem between the Mexican population and the Anglo-American population. You had entrepreneurs that came into places like South Texas, created great battle kingdoms, and they began to fence the area. And there was also legislation passed uh, uh, to, uh, to, put, uh, to protect the fences, uh, uh, and that it became a crime to cut them. So the Mexican and the indigenous population, which had been marginalized uh, and uh, 
and they they were used to uh, uh, acquiring uh, cattle and sheep in the open range. And uh, the, but after the Civil War, the, they wanted to open this, uh, this uh, uh, movement of cattle, uh, which was, uh, in, and then they, they uh, began therefore to criminalize the process of taking cattle from Texas into Mexico, which had been a, um, a method of, of uh, an economic method in South Texas for the indigenous and the Mexican popu uh, population. And so the, on the Mexican side, their position was that the, it was legal because in the US side, it was considered that uh, the cattle, regardless who had brought it and uh, 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 how it originated in Texas, that uh, it belonged to Americans. On the Mexican side, they saw that the indigenous population and also the Mexican population, they saw them, well, they're Americans. So once they cross over to Mexico and they sell the cattle there, uh, they're not breaking any laws. And then there's a whole history of the, of the, free, of the free zone. But the, the problem really, to get to the last point, when the, the uh, fencing walls take place and uh, uh, fencing battles take place in the 1870s, uh, by, by this time, the United States has had established a very lucrative business of, of uh, stock racing. And uh, about a million dollars was being made at that time in the cattle industry. So the, the problem that uh, th therefore took place affecting the indigenous populations was that uh, uh, various Native American groups such as the, uh, uh, the Kikapu, uh, the Seminoles, the Black Seminoles, and the Potawani had uh, uh, moved into Mexico and they, and they were the ones that were being uh, charged of stealing the cattle. Uh, from the United States. So the US government wanted to relocate them into Mexico and place them in the Oklahoma reservations. Uh, so uh, if and it, the US Congress in 1877 just took the position that they were just going to go into Mexico and kill the Indians if they did not uh, come back to, uh, to uh, the United States. So the, the cattle, the, the fencing was a general part about the history of, of Texas in relation to the growth of capitalism. How, how many um, heads of cattle uh, was there at that point? They estimated uh, in a study conducted by US Congress in 1853, they estimated that there was over 3 million cattle uh, roaming uh, around Texas with the majority um, in, in, uh, in South Texas. And they also estimated in that same study, 1853, that there were approximately 160,000 to 180,000 Native Americans, and most of them were located along the border. They didn't give any specific names. They just uh, uh, talked about the indigenous uh, menace, the problem that they had. It's, it's interesting to think about, you know, we think about the fences as a way to keep the cattle inside a, a particular range, but then, you know, what you're telling us was also that the fences was a way to keep people out, you know, the, yes. the, the in, undesirable people out, you know, which is, which is how the border fence is, you know, kind of ideologically, in a way, uh, thought and conceptualized uh, along the borderline, too. Um, um, yes, Juan, of I course. I just want to add also to the, the whole idea of fencing. It's part of that colonial mentality of, of segmentation, of being able to control a certain area, um, along with the, uh, like the, the, the border boundaries um, are set up to, to control who and what is whose. And it sets up that whole idea of nationalism. And in Texas, it sets set up that whole idea of, I got the money, you, you can't come into my place. And, uh, and that's that created a big problem with the fencing. Um, and also at the same time, the, a lot of the, 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 the southern population of, of, uh, of, uh, of the, tribe, the, the tribes that were in that area, 
became part of the the cowboy uh, mentality. And they were the ones that, because they knew that the trails, they knew where the places were, they were, they were, they were the ones that were, that were uh, forming part of the, 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 the new cowboy mentality that originated in Texas is actually coming from the, uh, pe the people in Northeastern Mexico and, and South Texas. Thank you, Juan. And, and thinking about other structures along the border, uh, the Amistad Dam is a binational infrastructure um, between Mexico and the United States. It's the largest dam in the Rio Grande. The border line, you know, runs through the middle of the reservoir, right? So it's not visible. It's kind of there, intangible across the water. And um, and actually, the Texas Archaeological Research Lab here at UD Austin holds. Uh, I would say the the the, the entire uh, you know archaeological uh, remains and and uh, objects that were found there during the at that point it was called I think salvage uh, excavations right um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how many archaeological sites are there thought to be covered underwater what happened if if everything could be recovered, what kind of elements, um, you know, are housed at Taro? But also why that area uh, is unique. Um, Archaeologically, uh, right, yeah. Yeah, I could really speak. Right, okay. So that's a lot of area to cover. There's not going to sit back and relax because here comes a long story. Um, so, so the Texas Archaeological, I've recently, uh, since January, become director of the lab. So I've inherited many, many issues that um, tr we're trying to work through and so forth. Um, what the lab really is, is the, is the center or a place for, in essence, the state of Texas for all archaeological sites. So all sites are recorded for the state through through our lab in terms of maps and if places are excavated or there are finds, uh, a lot of times those come to the lab. Uh, the reservoir from Amistad is one of many reservoirs that were being constructed through the 1950s and 60s and 70s and even up to more recent times. Uh, so, so many of the findings from those from that kind of work has come to uh, the lab. How many sites are specifically from the Amistad? I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of sites across the state, um, and some are from dam building or reservoirs. Some are from building roads with text dots. Some are from uh, Corps of Engineers work. Uh, others are from park work. Uh, Texas parks as well as national parks and so forth. Uh, so, so there are lots of items, lots of materials uh, that, that have come to the lab that are there. And they are through, at that time, what was called salvage archaeology and then became known as public archaeology and then became known as cultural resource management, which exists to this day. So most archaeologists today that are employed uh, are doing cultural resource management. And what that means is that any time that there is any kind of federal funds that are being used or uh, public funds, city, state, county, et cetera, national, uh, then, then there has to be an archaeological and environmental impact statement. And that includes archaeological and historical analyses. So what that means is that archaeologists would go through a place like the, that's going to be at one time was just the river flowing through there, but this whole area is going to go underwater. So archaeologists would survey this entire place and they find a few places where there might be remains from something in the past historical or, or, or going back to ancient times. Uh, and then the archeologists have to assess, is it just something like, a camp, in the case of archeology, span is it something like a campsite or is it something more significant? If it's more significant, then additional work needs to be done. So we're gonna excavate and then you excavate and whatever is found is documented as best as is possible with the time that's left. And that's what's saved or salvaged or conserved and protected uh, for the future. Now, the catch to that, of course, is we don't see and find everything that there is. We're only sampling. The other part is once the bulldozers come in, and, and I have been there in my earlier, I'm too old for this now, but in my earlier days when I did some of this kind of work, you know, we'd have people yelling at us because we're holding them back. 
right? We're holding quote unquote progress back, et cetera, uh, because we're not moving fast enough and so forth. And if we were lucky, we would get friendly with the person operating the bulldozer or a backhoe, and they would call us on the side if they came across something once our work was done. Uh, so you can imagine that there's, there were lots of ancient remains of different kinds that have simply been bulldozed away and, and lost. So uh, you know, a big part of what the lab does is to protect and conserve these uh, you know, for, for the future, basically. So that's the short version. So why it's why it's special why about Amistad? Yeah. So so there yeah so there are two parts. So one of the the sort of special things um, that we know of from the Amistad area, the Devil's River in particular, uh, because of the way the the river goes through there and it has these deep canyons and these solution cavities on the canyon walls, which we tend to call caves, but they're really just rock shelters. And fortunately, it's such an arid environment; it's very dry. Uh, and so there's great preservation. You, you've seen a lot of the uh, fiber material, sandals and mats and baskets and things that are preserved because it is dry and protected there that way. Uh, this is where many of the pictographs as well as petroglyphs that come from that area because the preservation is great for those. Many of those things would have existed in other areas and other things that would have been painted across the state and into South Texas, but they're not preserved. They, they get weathered away over time. So it's a special place because those things are preserved and they were documented, those Kirkland paintings, that's from the 1930s. And a lot of what was painted by Kirkland and his wife and documented and, and, and what you're preserving and, and, and for prosperity here, a lot of those things, because of the building of the Amistad Reservoir, it increased the humidity in the area. And so many of these things have started to fade away or mm. little bits of the limestone fall off, the, off of the walls and we lose a lot of that information. So some of these paintings and some of the work that's being done and the interpretations and the analysis are critical because as time goes by, we see less and less that is there. I, I wanted to um, continue with, with Juan and, and um, asking him, uh, you, you were um, telling us about how some of the pictographs are prophecies uh, of people who dreamt, you know, uh, the different industries that have come across Texas uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, we see we see the black snake, for example, represented in some of the pictographs, the fracking, the horizontal fracking. We see the flares. We see the gentrification and urbanization uh, of different cities across the region. Um, I know, and, and, and Mackenzie in the introduction, uh, you know, said that, that you're act, an, an environmental activist and uh, the way I came across Juan's work is uh, Juan came to a community center in Ball Heights in Los Angeles that doesn't exist anymore called La Concha and was uh, telling us about uh, the different villages uh, that you were holding the ground when the construction of the border during the last administration was happening, specifically one of them, Jalui village, uh, close to, was that, is Mission is the name of the? Far. Huh? Far. 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 Uh, and so maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, your involvement in, in these different front lines, maybe starting with that case of um, halting the construction of the border wall uh, through, through these through this, uh, camps and, and villages that, that the Carrizo and allies established across the border. Uh, and maybe also, you know, what are the struggles that are you involved in, in today? Well, one of the things that, I, that um when I was growing up, um, my, my grandfather told us that there was land that belonged to us in, in Hidalgo, Hidalgo and Stark County, and that there was land there that was ours, and, uh, and we had to reclaim it. <clears throat> well, of course, you know, with my colonized uh, education of, you know, getting degrees and all that kind of stuff, I started looking for land deeds and also going to the Spanish land grants. And, uh, but what he was talking about was looking at the ancestral lands that are still there. And so I knew that there was land there that belonged to us. 
<clears throat> they needed protection. But at the same time, when they were doing the, the, the um, uh, they were putting on the board, the, the so-called border wall, because it's not at the border in Texas. I want you to know that. So for those of you that are pro-border wall, you're wrong. It's not at the border. Uh, it's another one of those segmentation, big fences that they want to put up. Um, I think that <clears throat> we need to understand that that there was a, that there was a, a people that lived there for a long time, a lot longer than anything. Some of these remains go back, you know, prior to present time, and uh, um, uh, so we, uh, knowing that there there was some uh, Loma Sandia, Loma Alta, and also with knowing that in Brownsville we had the uh, Garcia pasture, which is made up of 32 villages that are right there along the coast and close to the Rio Grande. Um, and then looking at, at the perspective of the villages that, that made up Brownsville, Panque Alegre, uh, all these little names that, that you find in South Texas are all names that were given to the more missionized um, population of my people that remained in South Texas that became sedentary, uh, not the ones that became the migrants that went to Michigan and, and became seasonal workers in, in the panhandle, um, or the cab or the ones that were doing the ranching like my grandfather, because um, he worked for the King's Ranch for like uh, five years and then he moved on to start working with private ranchers in the area around Sarita, all the way into, cor into Corpus and past Corpus. So he knew all these lands and he knew all these rivers and all these villages and he would visit them. And the ones that he was more particular about was our band who are the Cotoname band. And, um, and they're found right there in Hidalgo and, and uh, around Hidalgo and Cameron and, and Star County all the way to Zapata. Uh, Zapata is actually named after a Carrizo a native. I just want to say that too. But, uh, but one of the things that we, we looked at the villages, there's a, there was a village that, was, um, that we set up for a year and a half. We occupied that land at, uh, at a Freedman Cemetery, which was an underground railroad for slavery during the Confederate War, which is called Eli Jackson Cemetery, which is a state historical cemetery nobody was paying attention to, not even the state, not even some of the family members that, 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 were, married, that were there until we came in and we recognized that we had family members that were buried there as well. We started taking care of it. We remained there for a year and a half, became very controversial um, because nobody's occupied that land for that long. And as a matter of fact, under squatter's rights, we probably own the land now. <laughs> but the, the thing is that I, I think people need to understand that there was, there was villages right there. There's an old Pony Express uh, building right across the street from it. So any, anywhere you find those kind of things, you're going to find that there was a village at that place. And this is a, a and right outside on, right off the military highway, which is what, 281, running running toward uh, Brownsville. Keep going, keep going south. Um, and it's a veterans highway. And, and so if you go into those areas, you'll see how we were able to make them change the direction of the wall and keep it on keep it on the other side of the levee but they did dig close to it and the closest the closest um grave that was to that area was a confederate grave of a confederate soldier so we made a big deal about it here with all these racists and they were going to dig up one of their own races you know to to, to build a wall and uh, I think it made it made it made, it made a, a big impression in, in what was happening. We were able to 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 make them move the wall. Now the next thing was that uh, that my, what the land that my grandfather was was talking about is based right there in where they have this construction going on, where the five the five million dollars or the five million dollars that were given for uh, congressional money that was offered to continue building the wall. And they're, they're, they're trying to improve the levee, but they're actually putting up a fence. Um, it's there on, on what we call the Cavazos land, which is, of course, some of my relatives. But it's uh, 75 acres that are there. And at the very end, we were able to lease, the tribe was able to lease one of the lots, which is right next to where they built the, uh, 
the wall by Bannon and uh, Colfash. The, the private, the private. The, the private, the private wall that is now being eroded and going to fall into the river and become a bridge for people to come back and forth. Uh, so, I mean, um, that's exactly what, what is happening there too. And, and we were trying to protect that, but that was privately owned. There was nothing we can do other than just sit there and yell at them all the time with the signs. But um, we couldn't even file, file, a, file a lawsuit against them because uh, they, they had uh, gotten the ETP law firm and I don't know, you know, the uh, energy transfer partners people that put up the no dapple uh, pipeline and also the Trans Pecos pipeline, those guys uh, to, to defend them on whatever was going on. So they were able to put up a wall, but uh, I mean, it's coming apart now because of the erosion. They, they, they compromised the banks of the Rio Grande to where it's starting to erode even more. And it's really affecting the lease land that, we're, that we have because it's coming right up against that, 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 that area there. And the wildlife there that was there before they started building that wall is no longer there. The uh, Altamira Oriole doesn't show up anymore that was there. The lizards that were, that were prominent in the area are all gone. Um, so we, 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 we were able to measure and monitor these things and we continue to do it by going out there live and recording it and also putting it down on paper so people realize that these things are happening there. But at the same time, when they were trying to start continue the wall in in Abrams, where the, I don't know if you know what Old Monty is, uh, or uh, if you know, if you ever been to South Texas, there's a, a 900 year old cypress tree that is uh, that you can go and visit. But people like myself, they, as soon as I show up there, all the Border Patrol and ICE agents show up. Because I don't know what they're thinking I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to leave some tobacco at the, at the tree, and that's all I do. But that's an old village there, too. So from, from that area all the way to Star County, they have found 60 more villages. And I don't think, and, and you, you said you hadn't heard about it yet. And, uh, and they haven't even reported them to, to anybody yet. But the, uh, um, the archaeologist involved, we don't even know what his name is, or their name, sorry. <clears throat> but um, um, we continue to, 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 we were able to stop the wall there. Now they're figuring a way how they're going to go around. They can't go any closer to the river because they'll, they'll break the treaty with Mexico on the water rights. So the wall is actually somewhere, anywhere from a mile to two miles away from the river. And sometimes it's just like 100 yards, like the one that's at the lease land. And um, so we, we're concerned about preserving these villages that are along the river. So with what I was telling them, that anywhere you go on the river, you're gonna find a village and everywhere they've been gone to, to, to try and put it. And with their due, and doing their due diligence, they have found the village and, uh, or some archeological remains. There, there was a lot of traveling up and down the river because the river was used as a, as a way of, of uh, transportation. Uh, we, did, we did have canoes and, uh, and that's evident. Uh, because of some of our names are like Cano, it means it means canyon or or the canoe the the canyons look like canoes. So we the, the Cano is is uh, in our language Cano means the same thing, it means canyon or or a canoe, and um, and that's that's all documented. And now that you have those sixteen villages, there were only sixteen that they could get on because some of it is on other private land. So I mean, apparently, you know, there's, there's, uh, they found remains and otherwise they wouldn't have stopped. But we were able to get uh, um, CBP and, and, and uh, Homeland Security to put it on paper and they announced it on the newspaper. So we had them on their word, but they waived the Native American Grace Protection Repatriation Act because of that. So they, they could dig things up, but they said if they found anything, they would, re they would report it and they would go around it. They would try to preserve it, and then so that's what we, we've been able to, to do right now, as as a tribe uh, that, especially in, in, in Hidalgo County. So from Abrams to La Grulla in um, in um, in South Texas, then and all of these the, the letter that we got from them, they, uh, they said we're not obliged, but we recognize we recognize that your people were here. That's the land that belonged to my to to the Cotonama to our band. That's only part of it. 
because there's a larger larger area in that area. Uh, Juan, one question. Don't, don't mean to interrupt you. Can you speak like uh, following that, like uh, the relationship uh, between the, the border uh, fence and the uh, infrastructure uh, and the oil and gas infrastructure? Oh yeah. I mean, the thing is that in 2019 they passed a law. Um, was it 3557 house bill 3557 that uh says that you can't protest or impede um the construction of any infra critical infrastructure is the, is the way they say it so apparently they they set up what a critical infrastructure is and and in this case it would be the derricks the pipelines the lngs and by the way we were we were able to shut down one lng in brownsville as well the anova it's gone and we're working on Texas LNG right now. They're running pretty much scared because they're not getting any money, any investors in it. But uh, when we start looking at these critical infrastructures, we as the native people, and the way I was taught was, you got you got to have your water, you got to have your land so you can plant, and you got to have you got to have the air so that you can breathe. Because if we can all take a breath, we we breathe the same air. I mean, right, some some of them might have COVID now, but you know, I, I can't. But the thing is, it's still the same air, and there's no other planet in the universe that we know of that has the same amount of nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen for us to be able to to to, to do that. But here we are destroying that destroying that that air and that, that and polluting the water that we need to drink. Um, and uh, and I think that critical infrastructure to us is water, air, land and the human beings that are, that, that are there. We never overgrazed, overcropped any area. We stayed, the most that I know of, at least 28 days, one moon cycle to the other, and we moved on to another village and let the other one recover, and then we'd, we'd, we'd come back the other way. So I think that the, a lot of it you know, has to do with uh, how the narrative needs, needs to be changed on the, pol the political scene and stop uh, fossil fuels from uh, uh, changing the narrative to what they wanted by putting money into a, the politic, the politic people. As a matter of fact, I was there to try to disrupt that uh, that vote when they were voting. We got up and started singing our songs. So I think that we need to to be aware that um, even with SpaceX, I'm not going to bring SpaceX. It's okay. Even with SpaceX. <laughs> They're, we're demanding an EIS. We don't even know if they they put in an EIS. We we don't even know if they they've abided by NACPRA or any of any of the other uh, laws that that enact uh, in, in an environmental impact study. And at the same time, what's happening? We're demanding to be a voice for Mars and for for the Moon, because otherwise we're going to get what we got 500 years ago when we were invaded here. And uh, and this was this is not a new world. This is the same world, and with with a totally different colonized mentality that that is about oppression, and and pollution, and destroying what's uh, five hundred years ago. They came here for the resources, gold, silver. Five hundred years later, they're still extracting the resources from this planet, exporting them out. The LNGs are not are not are not to be used here. They're going all overseas, and. Um, Again, I, I think we need to be aware of, of how it's affecting the Native American communities, especially ours down in South Texas and throughout, all the way up into um, into uh, Amarillo, yeah. into Adobe Walls. But that's that's interesting to think how Texas, in a way, has always been kind of this frontier towards you know the west if you wish mm. now with spacex and uh it's like this frontier to the universe but it also this economic frontier as you know marta was explaining you know through the process of fencing but you know texas is the main exporter of goods of the united states it's the state that most exports stuff out of the united states of course including fossil fuels and, and I know, Martha, that you did you did study some of the fossil fuel production more along the, the Gulf Coast, right? If I'm not wrong. Yeah, yes, it was primarily uh, the. Mm. I'm so sorry. It was pr primarily the negotiations between the United States uh, and Mexico in trying to privatize the Mexican oil industry. 
uh, so that um, they the, the oil that would be um, exported to the United States were cheaper, but uh, the Mexican Congress and the Mexican people uh, stood up against those policies. Um, but the, 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 there was rather a compromise in uh, 2013 that American companies would be able to uh, explore for about, in a contract now, they would able they would get a fifty percent profit as opposed to before two thousand thirteen they were not supposed to uh, explore for any land uh, any oil in in, Mex in Mexican land but associated with that is that uh, uh, through previous negotiations Mexico used to be uh, independent in terms of the use of uh, of uh, natural gas but the, uh, due to that supposedly. Uh, purchasing the gas uh, that from the United States was uh, would be cheaper. Mexico gradually decreased its infrastructure in developing the gas industry in Mexico, and now really is dependent on the United States. So that's why uh, they, the uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, Juan would probably know more, but there's about five different connections of, uh, of pipes that are going to go be going through Texas. Uh, in order to bring more gas into uh, into Mexico, but um, it's the in terms of the oil that the uh, along the the coast, uh, very few people know that the Deer Shell Oil Park is a Mexican fifty percent owned Mexican company and uh, a U.S. owned company. Um, and now um, Mexico wants to buy it directly from from the Shell, uh, Shell Oil Company, and they they have. So the United States the United States uh, is against that because it's uh, a company that will be be owned 100% by Mexico, and they're questioning also whether Mexico has the finances and money to. Uh, maintain uh, that that uh, that the, those oil that oil uh, co uh, company uh, by itself so a lot of politics are taking place right now that are going to be changing along the gulf but the main thing is the really the the the, uh, the natural gas pipelines that are projected and have been agreed upon between mexico and the united states that will go through through uh, texas and that, and that if we think about the wall and the border fence, we tend to think about it as an infrastructure of security, right? Uh, that will affect, uh, you know, the, the immigration, the coming of illegal aliens as they're named. But then, you know, uh, when we start learning about these issues, we start to understand that also it is an oil infrastructure and in many cases a water infrastructure, not only in the case of the dam as, as a, you know, as a border infrastructure, but also the way, for example, how in the Rio Grande Valley, a lot of the valves and water valves are kind of trapped behind the, the wall because it's not, you know, it's constructed like one, even one mile into the land, right? So to so also understanding uh, the, the, you know, the, how security and militarization um, across the border are also benefiting, you know, um, different kinds of extraction uh, and industries that operate here in Texas. Well, I find it very interesting what you're saying about what the Mexican company, but Enbridge is, is a Canadian company owned, and they're putting pipelines even here. They're, they just uh, bought um, the Moda LNG, and uh, and I think that <laughs> they decide who who they want to to be part of uh, you know a company in, in the United States. But um, they put in the line three up in Minnesota. They were they were. And the, now they're coming into Texas. You know that since 2016, there have been 255 permits been given out. ETP, which is Energy Transfer Partners, the ones that we had such a hard time with at Standing Rock, uh, they've um, they've got six permits right now. Two of them already started up. Um, Valley Crossing Pipeline was an intrastate. There's another thing with intrastate and the and the jargon that they use and how they find loopholes to get through it. And they, so they cut right through our, our sacred sites. Uh, Valley Crossing Pipeline came across the coastal trail that goes all the way from from the Rio, the Rio Grande Valley all the way into 
into Port of, Port of Ramses. And, and it cut right down, it came right down and then came across into uh, San Benito and uh, right outside of Brownsville and then cut into where they want to put the um, Texas LNG. And it's already connected to Mexico in the Tuxpan pipeline that is Kinder Morgan owned. Uh, so uh, that's one of them. The other one was, the, of course, the trans Pecos pipeline. And um, the only one that hasn't connected yet is Comanche pipeline. That's because we're fighting it. Uh, the Comanche trail pipeline. Um, there's so much stuff that we can, we can talk about how, how racist it is and how they're really continuing a genocide towards the native communities in Texas, uh, regardless of who it is. Um, even with Comancheria up in Midland, uh, there's a company called Comancheria and uh, they're naming their, their disposal wells after the Comanche chiefs. They already got one named Nakona and they were, they got they got permits to do another one called uh, Big Hump. And uh, that was another Comanche chief. So when when that's like a slap in, in the face to the native people, we can do whatever we want because you guys don't exist anymore. And that's a, the attitude Texas takes. There's no Indians in Texas, right? That's what they say. Everybody says that. But you have three federally recognized tribes and you have five that are not. And one of them that's the us that are that are looking for federal recognition just to save our mineral rights and to be able to make a big difference in what's happening. And I think that that racism continues when we promote it as much as we do. So. I, I want to add a little bit about the border fence uh, that scholars have documented. There's uh, there's a book by fencing called Fencing Democracy by uh, Miguel Diaz Barriga and, Mar and Margaret Dorsey in which they examined the point that one was talking about the location of the border wall, that it, it has been located in the interior of counties and communities. And then uh, some, some Mex many Mexican communities are located on the south side of the border. And the location of the, of the, the border was located uh, to reduce undocumented migration because it was considered that in certain neighborhoods, um, 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 the, they, they protect or give refuge to undocumented people so that by keeping these certain neighborhoods on the, on, behind the wall, that will reduce uh, undocumented migration. So it's a really good book that examines the, the, the infrastructure, especially of South Texas in the location of the border. And also Martin Salinas, who wrote the book on the Indians of the Rio Grande Delta, in, in some of the conversations we've had as a tribe with him, he, he recognizes the fact that there used to not be a Brownsville. It was called uh, Camargo. It, Camargo was on both sides of the river. And so was Reynosa. They were on both sides of the river. And Matamoros, they were on both sides of the river. All these. And it wasn't until they set, they set the boundaries that they started changing them and rename, renaming them. And so they renamed them Brownsville, Far. And yeah, I don't know if you know what West Leco means, but it's named after the West... Uh, uh, West Lake uh, Company, land company. That's where West Lake comes from. It's not even Spanish, but it sounds Spanish, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Fred, uh, we were uh, curious. I know uh, you have been in, in conversation with Juan and uh, other uh, tribal members about um, artifacts and even like uh, human remains that, that, are, that are part of uh, Tarl UT Austin collections. So how is that process of uh, kind of like a giving back? Well, I know it's, it's complicated, but I think it will be interesting if you speak about that. Um, I will try. <clears throat> okay. um, so, so one of the um, concerns that I've inherited uh, has to do with human remains that are held at, at the lab. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, I, I've spoken with a number of, uh, as Juan already alluded to here, there are what are known as federally recognized tribes, there are non-federally recognized tribes, uh, and I've spoken with um, many groups on both sides of, of that line uh, to, to explain what, what I have in mind and what we might do uh, towards this end. So, so the, the simplest part of, of it, I, I will explain this way. Um, well, first of all, I want to make it clear that archaeologists are not bad people. 
So I have to say that to everybody in the back, uh, because because I've been accused of, of that in this in this process. And 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 the reality is, as I mentioned before, you know, the archaeologists are when, in cultural resource management. When when we come across artifacts, villages, burials, and so forth, uh, you know, from my experience and in all the time that I've ever seen it, all of these aspects and and the people are treated with respect. Um, they're they're saved. They're brought back to the lab. They're placed in acid-free uh, containers, boxes, uh, so there's, so they don't decay. Uh, they're kept in a dark room that's incredibly cold, air-conditioned, climate-controlled, so that they don't decay. Uh, and we become the custodians of these versus them being bulldozed away or becoming part of something else that way. Um, <clears throat> but the but the problem is that then we are we are holding all of these remains, human remains as well as artifacts, and so I've talked to a number of people and archaeologists and so forth that we would like to see all of these individuals reburied, returned to the earth, regardless of whose ancestors they they are, they may be, and so forth. That's not for us to necessarily determine, although. Um, you know, Juan and I may have our ideas, and Mark they have our ideas about how who that who those people are and, and how they're related and so forth. Uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, you know, the, the, the ancestors as they're referred to should be returned to the earth. Someone way back when, uh, whether they were family members or friends or acquaintances found and had a reason to bury these individuals. Uh, unfortunately, they were removed from the resting places because a dam was being built or a road was being built or somebody put in a bridge or whatever it was. Um, and we can't return them to the exact place that they came from, but, you know, have an idea about where they should be returned in, in some in some respect. Uh, so uh, the the real complication to this and, and it's a, it's a it's an emotional issue. I, I wish to avoid all of the uh, politics and the economics that come into play, and I make that very clear. My interest, my concern is that these are individuals that should be returned to the earth, and we're doing our best to work towards that. NAGPRA, which is within the Department of Interior, uh, is, the, is the federal entity that controls who can have remains back and who can't to a great extent. NAGPRA is the one, and this is a federal government issue, who's defining, you know, who are the federally recognized groups versus the non-federal recognized groups. And that's the part that gets very political and complicated. From my perspective, you have lots of people federally recognized and not federally recognized who are of Native American descent and who have every right to seek what they will call their ancestors and to have them reburied and so forth. That's all proper and fine. So my role is multiple. Uh, I'm working, uh, trying to finish up a, a document that goes through my college, through the provost, through the president, that then goes from the university to the state legislature, eventually to the governor's desk, eventually from there to Washington, D.C. and NACPRA. And I've been told in no uncertain terms, that's the process that we have to go through. I Fred Valdez, I am not allowed to go to somebody at the legislature and say, hey, we need to do this or that. I can't go to the federal because I thought, which is common sense, I have this plan. Let me go talk to somebody at NACPRA and we can get this done. And you know, the university has liaisons, people that work between us and the federal government and people that work between us and the state government. And I'm nobody to go talk to anybody in the federal government. I basically told that in almost as many words. Uh, and, and they said, no, you have to come up with this and you have to do all of these different things. And then we go to, to take care of that part of it. So fine. But in the meantime, part of it is, and, and I've had several meetings with Juan and family members and so forth. And, and I think we're all thus far, having spoken to different groups, having spoken to a number of institutions across the state who also have concerns and issues over this, uh, Everyone is in agreement about having these individuals reburied. They are human beings, they're not artifacts and so forth. Now the problem is, uh, let's say uh, uh, you know, tribe X comes to us at the lab and they say, hey, we're, we're from, uh, you know, we're from Dell County, I'm making this up. We're from Dell County and, and you have four of our ancestors and we want them. But 
but Tribex is not a federally recognized group. So when that request is made, we now, by federal law, have to send out about 40 or 50 letters to federally recognized tribes that are in and around the Texas area and say, Tribe X would like these four individuals back from Dell County. Um, is there any opposition? And we have to give them 30 days or 60 days, whatever it is. And inevitably, for whatever reason, one or two will say, no, we don't want those remains to go to Tribe X. We're now stuck. We can't do anything about that. Uh, that's the federal law. Now, Tribe X will come back to us, to me, because I've had this said to me about three weeks ago, and said, well, but it's your responsibility now to go back to that federally recognized group that said, no, we want to know why do they not let us have our ancestors back? And two, are they going to take possession of them if they're not wanting us to have them? Okay. So I start that process, and then the federally recognized group says to me, hey, 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 you need to back up a little bit. So you're the you're the curators. You're you're the people taking care of the ancestors. It's not your place to question us. If Tribex has a problem with us and our decision, they need to go to Nagpra. They can try to go to Nagpra, but Nagpra now won't deal with them because they're not federally recognized. So you're back to back to square one. Mm -hmm. So my solution, and I've spoken with Juan in detail about it, I've spoken with Martha, I think about this a couple of times as well, is that what we need to do in the state of Texas, at first I thought a state park, but I was informed that maybe it should be a national park. That part doesn't matter a whole lot, but let's say it's a, it's a, a national park because it's protected, right? There are rangers and people that protect the land. Within that park, a certain amount of acreage should be set aside <clears throat> as a Native American park with trails and places to rest and so forth. Within, within that Native American park will be a cemetery, the equivalent of a cemetery, and it gets more complicated than that, so I found out. But ideally, there would be the cemetery in the shape of Texas, and the individuals that are housed at our lab, which come from at least 50 different counties, would be placed in the approximate location of those counties within the shape of that cemetery. So if they happen to be from Zapata County, uh, maybe they go down towards that south part of Texas. If they're from Travis County, they would go in that central part of Texas and so forth. And that's about as close as we're going to get to for, for some of them. Some, but we have to get NAGPRA permission to allow us, the University of Texas, to rebury all of these people. And that's what I'm doing and trying to get to. Uh, most people are fine with that. Once we have that permission, once that has taken place, and it will take a year or more because of the because of how fast everything works through legislatures. So somebody from the Texas legislature called actually two days ago. I had a long conversation with her. She works for somebody who works the legislature. They want me to work with them to pass some things in the law, into law in Texas. And I said, that's great and fine. I'm happy to work with you. I cannot approach you. You have to approach me. But it doesn't matter what the state of Texas says because this is federal law. We still have to get to that point. So, but once we have permission for reburial, then Tribex may come to me and say, but we have this other place to bury them over in this location or in this county. We have a place that we can take them. I would say that's great and fine. That's wonderful. Uh, we have one individual right now that we that's uh, a female burial. Uh, and it turns out that because of DNA and of direct lineage, uh, we found a descendant, or we know of a descendant in West Texas, actually, uh, up by Sol Ross uh, State University. And so we've been working with him to get his ancestor back to him. And so we, we've we've done all the paperwork with NAC because it's still NAGPRA. We still we've done all that, even though it's bio, it's DNA and it's straightforward. Uh, the catch is NAGPRA then takes that information. They have to publish it. We have to wait a month. And then it'll be another month. And so, so something that should be pretty simple and straightforward and obvious will take a couple of months. So this other one is even more complex. So sorry for that long version, but that's a lot. No, that's, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. But yeah, I just wanted to say, it like, seems like a lot of fences to jump, actually. Oh, yeah, and I can talk about a little bit about land, too, if you, I mean, when it yeah. comes to that Native, yeah. Native yeah. American land, because they're... You know, Want to refer to about a few groups that are in the state that are recognized and so forth. Texas is a big, as you all know, is a big, big state. If you take all of the land in Texas and you, you count up what's put aside as reservation or Native American land in the state of Texas, 
Native American land in the state of Texas is just under three one thousandths of a percent. What that means is that if you took all of the land in Texas and you took one percent, one percent of the land in Texas, and you divided that one percent into one thousand pieces, three of those one thousand pieces of one percent is Native American land for a place that was all Native American. It's, it's a shame. It's a really sad. You know? So I have no issues in pushing them to say we need land for a Native American park here and there and so forth. Yeah. But, but there are other issues that no a lot there. The, the, and also the other thing is that some of those um, tribes that are being consulted are were only pastors by and they're, they're Johnny come lately and never really had uh, a stay in, in a lot of what happened here. And so that, that, that ends up in some of the things in my, that I heard over the years from a lot of my mentors when they say, well, it's hard to be Indian. <laughs> and uh, growing up that way, not realizing that you have to get go through all this recognition by a government that we don't recognize um, because it doesn't really exist. They just started making laws, taking, taking stolen land, and, um, and then started dividing it any way they wanted to um, and stealing it, actually. Um, we have to we have to abide by these regulations um, that were put that were set into 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 motion by you know the the the, um, the plantation owners of the time and uh, and everything that was being um, set up by a plantation mentality uh, because that's the way it is and uh, we were part of it here. They call them encomiendas. So the encomiendas were the Spanish language, and the congreras later. And um, like encomiendas were done away with because some of the missionaries thought it was really, it was really uh, a bad way to treat the native people. Uh, so they changed it to congreras, but it was the same the same mentality. It just they changed the words. It's always changed the narrative to make it sound nicer. Like uh, they talk about false solutions, false solutions now like uh, uh, carbon capturing and blue hydrogen, all of that stuff is supposed to be green energy. <laughs> I'm sorry, this, it all sucks. It doesn't work that way. And uh, I think we need to be aware of, of that the whole thing here is to change the narrative. And I think that what, what um, um, Dr. Pablis is trying to do, and I, and I do appreciate what you're doing. Because so. eventually, you know, one of us will get our recognition and, and then, and you got to wonder why the, none of the original tribes in Texas get recognized in, in the United States. And a lot of it has to do with mineral rights. Um, and when you're taking out 255 permits that, that the railroad commission is handing out like candy, and they have no regulations, and they allow for racist uh, uh, names to be put on some of these disposal wells where they're putting contaminated water back into the ground that's going to affect you know the aquifers uh we have to we have to be concerned somebody's got to take us take a stand i for one was never this this loud or this verbal or vocal or controversial but you know we just got back from dc uh, talking about climate change um uh, making biden stick to his to his promises about climate change and uh and a lot of us got arrested <laughs> So, uh, so some of us walked away because they would give us an option. But the thing is that, you know, I'm not a criminal. I never was the bad person. And because you have books like The Indian Depredations of Texas that talk about, you know, carrying away their children and their, and their women, uh, we were just trying to survive and because people were on our lands and they're still our lands. And they're not gonna, that's not going to change no matter how many regulatory political laws are passed and I, I, I'm still going to change. I'm, I'm going to challenge the narrative every time. Um, what are we going to do? Kill another Indian? I don't care. I'm going to die. Hopefully not, Juan. But um, I just wanted to share that Juan does have some copies of, of his book and his writings that change the narrative here. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So, please. Uh, but I, I want to open it to a question and answer to the public. There is a microphone. Um, so please get close to the microphone for the, you know, um, streaming purposes. And uh, just thank you to, to, all, to all of the to three of you for, for uh, sharing your knowledge. Yeah. 
Hello, thanks to everybody. Fred, I think that was such a helpful um, like math equation that you just gave us. And I hope my students were taking notes about that because that was, was a really good way to put it. So Juan, it was fascinating listening to you talk about South Texas or your homeland and your people's homeland. And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about what it's like for you going out to the dry part of West Texas where Carolina and David shot this film that, that you were part of. Like coming to this different, to a dry place, to a more mountainous place, but still part of your ancestral homelands. Like how do you read that West Texas landscape from your point of view? Well, you know, as, as uh, <clears throat> we, we, uh, we followed the river and, and of course the Devil's River is an important place and there's documentation on that too, because of what happened with my great, great, great grandfather, Manuel Tavazos, and how he was the sole survivor, survivor of the massacre at the Devil's River. And he talks about, you know, how, what happened, what happened there. And so for me, I, I, I was raised in the panhandle where it's, you know, just flat, flat lands and, and, and things like that. So, and, and, the Permian Basin was a big area that I visited. We used to go hunt rabbits a lot of there. I'll say rabbits right now because you know we were young. But there were other things that were there. That, were, that but that's how we made, we ate. You know, we, we ate wild food. We ate, I ate prairie dogs, and so I mean I've eaten lizard. You know, so I mean I'm 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 used to to the thing because we didn't have the money that that and it wasn't until. You know, we decided to bring the the identity of the tribe out. That it became that it became that everybody woke up and everybody all of a sudden. Uh, but we were we, we were having such a hard time, and, and the difference between being the first generation born away from the Rio Grande and being born close to the Canadian and and between the Canadian and the White River, where you know it's kind of desolate itself, and the the lack of the, of water being there. We visited water sites all the time. The Concho River was one of them that we came to a lot, um, and that's why I know about the, about these sites, and that's why I think that um, when we when I when I talk about the diversity in Texas in our language, we have words for the uh, for the for the mountains, you know, for the hills, and so we know that one of the mountains in West Texas is where the, it's like the throne where the Creator comes, like comes and. Uh, creator sits there. You notice that I'm I'm using very non-gender words because we don't we don't know what creator is man or woman. You know, we just know creator comes takes care of us. You know, it's, that's more of a feminine side of it. So we're a matrilineal people anyway, matriarchal. Sorry, and so we we try to 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 make sure that we continue keeping that language alive so that our children can can be able to identify the things that are there, the Delaware Mountains. They have a totally different name in our in our in our in our sense. Guadalupe Peak has a different name in our in our in our in our sense. Even the river, you know, has a different name. Um, in San Antonio, you have the San Antonio River, which is actually the Paya Paya, and uh, there's a group called the Payayas, but it's not the correct way of saying what they're saying because it's not a it's not a Cahuatlan word. It comes from our language, and the poor and the poor pronunciation by the Spanish or, or even the, the Americans. Like when the Tennesseans came in, they, there was a Karankua chief that's, that was part of our people who he, they called him um, uh, Jose Miguel. And that was his name in Spanish. That's what they called him. But when the, when the Americans came in, the Tennesseans, they, they couldn't say Jose Miguel. So they started calling him Jose Miguel. So he became Hazi McGill. And uh, so the, the way that the, the colonization has happened is also through the language. So if we maintain our language and we interpret the way we see it, then I can say, I love West Texas. Martha has a story that that's where our, the, our people, when they're dying, they go have their last dance. And if you've ever been to Martha and seen the Martha lights, you can see them dancing all over the place. And all of a sudden, you see one of them shoot up. That's that's one of our ancestors going up to the, you know, to the Milky Way to be to start another campfire. But those are stories that I know that I've, I've been told that I grew up with, and it makes sense. So those are the connections that I have to these areas are the stories. 
a lot of these people don't have those connections. They have the blood, you know, but they don't have the stories. They don't have the teachings, and they don't have the knowledge of what of what really like. Well, what are the chances of my grandfather saying, "Go reclaim our lands," and then they find sixteen villages? You know, there is something there that's leading us to to, to go back and just to wake up and to maintain those things that are important to us. I mean, anywhere you go in South Texas, it's pretty desolate and it's pretty dangerous. Everything that that can bite you and 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 uh, prick you is there. You know, cactuses and acacias and all of that. Plants are an important part of who we are too, and they run all up and down the river. There used to be a tobacco tree that would grow down in Brownsville. It doesn't grow there anymore because it only grows down in West Texas because it's, we had tobacco here. It's called the tobacco tree, and we used it. And um, I don't know if you guys even know about that. See, those are things that are being left out of, of the history because the history now is all about right now, right? I mean, what happened 50 years ago? You know, nobody cares if Kennedy got assassinated, you know, on this month. I also wanted to add that regarding uh, West Texas, I, I always tell my students that the history of the class, of the material that you're reading in class, uh, there's an abundant more that has not been researched. In West Texas, we never hear anything about uh, the missions along the Junta de los Rios uh, uh, by the Concho and, and the Rio Grande. And, and uh, we know a little bit about the missions and the archaeology of it, but within the documents that, that the missionaries and administrators did document, they documented about many, many villages that were located next to these missions and into, in, and into the interior. That history, however, is part of New Mexico rather than, uh, the, rather than of Texas, but the archives exist and they, they are in Mexico City, but a lot of people are not, not interested in, in it. And so you just don't have to do the, the, the history of the missions, which I think it's very important to recover that history. But also in the records of the missions, they, the, the recorders chronicle what was taking place with indigenous villages surrounding the area, so. Well, and you can see that because of that, a lot of the missions are where there were, there's water, water supply. Exactly. And, uh, and so you know that there were villages there. So they built a mission for that. Um, in post Texas, the only thing I, I, I mentioned about that that's more more recent is the petroglyph of the the missionary walking. I mean, the the Spanish soldiers bringing in a lot of my ancestors, bringing them into the mission, and then the priest is cutting off their hands and feet. And and uh, but that was part of the the conversion that was going on at one time. And so missionization is one of the worst uh, parts of colonization in Texas that, that occurred. Uh, one, of the, one of the worst. But uh, that's where the, the term, I don't know, those of you that know Spanish, Indio Patarrajara, that means that they would cut your feet off and uh, you drag for the rest of your life. They, they would cut your tindy, t uh, Achilles tendon, and you'd have to drag yourself and they would look down on you, those that were converting. Your own people, your own relatives would look down and call you uh, Indio Pataraja. We get a lot of that now, and basically because it's really, it's really sad that uh, indigeneity itself has become an oppressive thing to people who are actually um, maintaining a tribal identity. And I think that that's one of the things that makes me very controversial, because I don't, I don't get, I don't buy into catch-all terms. And being indigenous is a catch-all term. It doesn't give you an identity. It just gives you a blood. You know, and which is okay. I mean, if you have the blood, it's fine. But the thing is, that doesn't have the teachings and the knowledge of the, of the land and uh, of the villages that, that, that gave us who we are and the history that's there. Um, there's um, a, a Nancy Hickerson, I don't really know her. She uh, used to be the Dean of uh, Anthropology at Texas Tech. And uh, one reason that it took me so long to get out of tech because I was arguing with them all the time about massacres and some of the stuff. But there's um, one of the primary characters in pre-Texas in pre history was the fact that there was a, a Juan Savieta and who had 30 clans, uh, Quisvenive who had 15, and then there's another one called Capitan Jose Miguel. And um, 
so when you read the, when you do this research you start recognizing that there's a good chronology that this lady gives but she doesn't she throws it all into this humano uh, catch-all term again and and throws it all into what what now they throw us into with the coilotecos it's a catch-all term but our language is totally different except that they extracted a few words of our language to make up that language which is a lengua franca that was done by the missionaries and that affects a lot of the way that we interpret things now like uh, i was talking about like like yanawana everybody using yanawana now but it actually comes from our word and it's three words it's yagma wana which means the place i rest that's all it means it's not spiritual water or spiritual river you know that's the real grand and uh so a lot of times we have to we have we you know we could we could become controversial because of the catch-all terms that they throw like it's not cool to could be called indian anymore and uh and so we have to be able to because it's racist I and mean, it's a catch-all term and we have to be careful with that we have another question yeah i want to thank you so much for this amazing uh round table conversation i wanted to ask actually about a work in the show and also, though, about your perspectives, um, the map, the amazing large map of Texas, and I'm just you look you. It seems like you are approaching um, Texas from so many different perspectives, and um, I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about, especially the pictographs and the and and it seems like the the map is connected to other works that are also in the exhibition. I just love to hear you comment on on the map. So that, that large that large drawing is called Somisek, which is the Garrizo Come Crudo uh, term to refer to their territory and significa it means Tierra del Sol, land of the sun. And we wanted to create such a, a kind of a counter map, if you wish, um, that uh, instead of presenting historical facts as we understand history of kind of that universal truth could, could uh, present a pluriversal perspective. That's something that uh, David and me align more with. And it's a term by Colombian sociologist Arturo Escobar, this idea of the pluriverse that counteracts uh, this more Western notion of universal truth or universe, right? And, and for us, um, we understand the construction of history as also a process of historical memory uh that is um precisely that constructed from the testimonies oral knowledges that are transmitted through generations and memories of the people who live in a place and continue to thrive and, and protect that place uh and in this case including of course one and his family and and his tribal and the tribal members um we think we think that um or we wanted to present kind of accounts of historical memory um of texas and and you know the different industries and processes of colonization that have existed in this territory from ideas of manifest destiny uh cattle uh oil industries prison industrial complex the construction of the border but also all that kind of intertwined with a uh, uh, biocultural diversity that exists in this region and that's why there's uh different plants and animal specimens that are that are um uh, represented and then of course we have uh, uh, uh we selected a few of the pictographs that for us were also important to speak precisely about the prophetic quality that we understand that these pictographs have so we have the flares, for example, that are also uh, the Kirklands are exhibited as part of the Kirklands uh, watercolors. We included the flare kind of right below the Permian Basin to, to um, suggest that visual connection and hopefully that the viewer can see the visual connection and the prophetic quality of this pictograph. Uh, we have we we included um, the moth, the Mothman, too, and um, and then paint rock too, as this um, kind of more um, time and astronomical representation of a, of, a, of a tribal identity precisely that Juan was mentioning. Um, the, the Rio Grande is kind of the, the central present that compositionally kind of is um, uh, guiding, you know, the rest of the vignettes of the drawing. And, um, 
and 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 I guess you know in a way also you know if the pictographs are telling a story we're trying to also tell a, a story or part of the story through the drawing too in this more visual way and also drawing from our own personal our own personal experience of doing field work and getting to know stakeholders here in the region too so that's a little bit about the story of Sumisek and I was telling that it, it, <laughs> Uh, CJ, I think, or who I was telling, maybe John, that, um, you know, it, it was in our uh, living room for almost a year. <laughs> we worked on it, uh, and that was kind of our uh, unwinding moment of the day. At the end of the day, we would uh, put a podcast, open a beer, <laughs> have some wine, and then draw. So that would be our, our activity for, <laughs> for, you know, unwinding and, and the end of the day and getting together as a couple and discussing um, and, and also it's a way of, as visual artists, uh, presenting part of the research that goes behind a body of work, right? That sometimes is not that visible uh, in, in final installations or in final work. So, so the drawing also as a way to bring together different aspects of the research. Yeah, I would like to add that uh, that map is to us, uh, what you were mentioning, uh, field work. I do think for us it's more like uh, uh, represent uh, the spiritual work uh, that we were like doing uh, during this uh, project, but also the learnings uh, along this uh, it's making. Uh, and I would like to, uh, just pretty quick, I do think uh, places are not neutral. So that map also represents um, those stories that are not that visible in Texas. It's kind of like you know, the, the big picture, the big narrative, but also all those uh, layers that conform uh, what this uh, state is. Yeah. Both like uh, uh, those like speaking from the past uh, to those speaking in the present and also like, uh, towards the future. Yeah. I just want to say one thing about West Texas. You look at our maps. Uh, some some of the original maps they'll they'll show where some of the native tribes were, but there's always a that void in West Texas. It never shows, and basically because you know there's more research that needs to be done, and a lot of the BRM, the burnt rock. This is what really got me interested back in the '80s was the the burnt rock medians that the, they're finding, and if you start connecting the dots then you start recognizing that you can start setting up the trails that were used along that thing like with uh with Benive, what i was saying about him was that comes from our language and that was recorded and uh quiz Benive means Benive is elk in our language and red and quiz means red so that was red elk and it just they just turned it around a little bit. it should be Benive quiz and um that's uh one of the things that I think it is important when you start looking at these at the, at the map and the map that they put together because it's more of a an experience of the map. It's not so much, you know, I'm just going to cartograph the map. It's that you've lived the map. You've you've been to West Texas. Uh, I have lived that experience through the stories, through my experience of being there, and and doing. I mean, I go up there for one thing, and that's just to go look at the bears. You know, because I really, I mean, I'm, I'm bear clan, so I want to go and make sure that I, I can, I can see those, the reason that we honor that bear, because, you know, uh, and I tell this story to everybody. There were a couple of years ago, they had a, a story in the, in the San Antonio News Express about a, a, a bear. It said the, the, the thing said Mexican bear run over I, I, in, on I-10 outside of junction that was the the whole story and i'm going like how do they know it's a mexican bear <laughs> did they check his papers <laughs> i mean it's crazy how we ourselves start naming things so that we can own them or control them and that's exactly what they're doing with nacra that's what they're doing with all of this other stuff equal is the same thing the challenges and it's, and it's a control of the situation control of people and we i refuse to be controlled that way, and we we were we were, we're a nation, and uh, we're, we're going to maintain that 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 much. My grandfather was very adamant about that. So, especially my grandma, because my grandma would yell at him if he didn't say that. So. <laughs> well, to, please join me in thanking our amazing um, roundtable members. Thank you so much.
I also want to give a big shout out to all the uh, team at VIC uh, and at Lilas Benson. And now it's time to relax and uh, join us in the courtyard for a little celebration. Thank you.